You're listening to the Voice of Russia in London. I'm Vivian Nunes, and today we're discussing the escalating battle over the world's most important accessory, the smartphone. This fight isn't being fought at electronics counters on the high street, though, or even in high school playgrounds. This battle is playing out in beige courtrooms around the world. In one corner is the world's market leader in the smartphone and tablet market, the Californian-based behemoth Apple. On the other side of the ring is the South Korean tech giant Samsung. Last month, the U.S. court ordered Samsung to pay Apple one billion dollars damages for infringing its intellectual property. A jury made up of nine laypeople in San Jose decided a number of Samsung's devices had blatantly infringed several of Apple's software and design patents. The jury also dismissed a counterclaim made by Samsung. Now Apple is seeking import bans on eight Samsung products, prohibiting their sale in the U.S. But Samsung says it will appeal against the original verdict. The clash between these technology titans has raised many questions about intellectual property. And just how much can be protected by a patent? To discuss some of those questions today, I'm joined in the studio by Kevin Palmer, the director and co-founder of the interaction design studio Kin. Aaron Wood is the head of trademarks and brand protection at Briffa, an intellectual property law firm here in London, and Professor Bart Clarissa, the chair in entrepreneurship at Imperial College London's Business School. Finally, joining us on the phone is the lecturer in intellectual property, innovation, and strategy from Queen Mary University of London, Dr. Gaetano Demeter. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Before we get into today's discussion, I'd like to ask each of you a simple question: What sort of smartphone do you have, and why? Kevin Palmer. Thank you.、Um, I have an iPhone, and、um, just because I've grown up with Apple all my life,、uh, a bit of an Apple fan and lover, and、um, uh, Have been using an iPhone ever since they came out. I had, I did、uh, use a Samsung smartphone for a while to to see what Android's interface was like, and I have to say, didn't really enjoy the experience, but it was definitely an eye-opening one. All right, Aaron Wood, what about you? Well, I'm probably one of those beige lawyers you talk about. So I've got a <laughs> BlackBerry,、um, just so that I can get my emails from work and all of that. But I am going to move to an iPhone pretty soon. Okay, Professor Clarissa. I have an iPhone because I was co-founding a mobile internet company some years ago, and everybody was laughing with me. I was a marketing guy,、mm. so it was technically so inferior to all the other ones' phones that I had to have something different. Still is inferior, but I still like it. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Demeter, which, what sort of smartphone do you use? I'm, I'm afraid I also have an iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's unanim- <laughs> unanimous, as I also have an iPhone and an iPad. So. Going by our straw poll, and actually in terms of market capitalization, Apple is the world's most valuable company. Presumably, people here then are voting with their feet. So the question has to be asked: What does it matter if Samsung copied their ideas? Why is Apple taking Samsung to court, seeking 2.5 billion dollars in the U.S.? Aaron Wood is the lawyer in the room. I'll start with you. Well, the one of the strongest points about the iPhone is the way in which it interacts, the way in which you drag various icons, and the various other. Th- Ways in which the phone works better than everything else. I remember back in the late nineties having a Nokia, and at the time everybody knew how the Nokia worked. And if you went to a different phone, you were lost. The beauty of the iPhone is that they've designed it so beautifully that it that all of the icons work so well. That is one of their competitive advantages, and so they want to do as much as they can to stop any competitors getting anywhere close to the way in which. They work in the way in which you interact with a mobile phone because they've really got the, the sort of zenith of the way it works. But if everyone's already buying the iPhone, why does it matter if there is another one on the market if no one seems to be buying that one? Well,、um, the there's always a time when you need to upgrade. Everyone needs to upgrade at some point, and and they want to keep you.、Uh, the the value in Apple is not just in the phones, but it is in, in all the content. Uh, and they're all of the sort of added extras that you, that they've got across from the phones. Doctor Demeter, on the phone, you've also got an iPhone, but you're an intellectual property lecturer as well. Why do you think it it matters if if Samsung copy some of iPhone's innovation? I don't know because I mean, to be honest, I'm I'm really happy that、uh, Samsung is in place in this market because on one side you have Apple that undoubtedly. Was the first mover. They did innovate. They changed 
totally probably the, the market for mobile phone, introducing the iPhone. But on the other side, I mean, to keep the innovation fast growing in this competitive market, it is important there is someone that is uh, following and is following quickly. So is that true that is it true that actually uh, the iPhone is still the most used probably smartphone? compared to the Samsung alternative. But the presence itself of alternatives is forcing iPhone, I mean, Apple itself, to further innovate constantly. That's why we're seeing so many new models coming out after one or two years. If there wasn't this uh, race, probably we couldn't see such a, a fast innovation. Plus, the two phones, they do have uh, incredible differences. The fact itself that Samsung is, is using Android and so on open source and uh, is running a lot of applications that you wouldn't be able to use over your iPhone, that constitutes a valuable alternative, in my, in my opinion. I might ask some of our guests in the studio then if we agree that Samsung were guilty of infringing this, these patents. Did they actually copy things that Apple had come up with first? Professor Clarissa, what do you think? First of all, we have to ask ourselves how are patents abused at this moment to follow a strategy? Innovation is not the same for both companies. Samsung is a typical incremental innovation company with customer segmentation as an objective. Apple doesn't want to do that. And for me, more or less abuses something in a patent trial using its cash in order to scare off and uh, get into that trial. The problem with that is that um, the results of such a trial are almost unpredictable. If you would look at the press at, in August, there were many different opinions about who would win, and Samsung also had won some court trials. And the problem is a little bit that uh, you see in other industries the same happening. If you go to Garmin and TomTom, Tom, they had a patent legislation battle some years ago, and basically all Garmin patents were considered to be obsolete. The question is, what does that lead to? So the real question is, has the patent system not reached the kind of limit at this moment in which it is inhibiting real innovation? The problem is not Samsung versus uh, Apple because both have enough cash. The problem is small companies that want to enter into a space like this. How are they going to ever raise enough capital just to start in a patent legislation battle? I think infringing is impossible if your patent is so broad that you even consider touch screens as protectable. Well, then all touch screens are patent infringements. Mm. So uh, where do we talk about? Uh, if you talk about any kind of innovation, you're infringing something because we are entering that very blurry space. So I think the real discussion is how can we go back to a patent system that helps innovation rather than inhibits uh, entrepreneurs from entering any space? It is just the case in the US that found that um, Samsung had infringed these patents because courts in Germany, South Korea, Australia and Japan also considered similar cases but found otherwise, though those cases are ongoing. What does it say about the patent laws in the US then, if this is only winning there? Well, uh, these are specialists around the table, but it's not patent laws as such, it's the, it's the broadness of a patent, the vagueness. So how precise does a patent need to be in order to be valid? And how broad can it be in order to be uh, inhibiting everybody? And the question is, as far as I see it, from an outsider point of view, I'm a professor in innovation, not entrepreneurship, not patents, as I see it is that uh, at this moment it's unpredictable. And it has to do much more with uh, media, with kind of uh, court decisions that are influenced by different factors rather than uh, size of the patent. So the question is, is this about sentiment? Is this about uh, rules? Uh, how can a layman's jury evaluate this kind of thing in such a technical kind of stuff? I have no idea. The only thing I see is that in industries you normally don't come to trials and you try to settle. And if it comes to trials, it's basically because of principles. Here we have a company that has as a principle having one product for a big market. You don't have a lot of markets where you only sell one product to such a huge amount of customers. If they want to compete with Samsung, that will mean that we'll, we'll need to segment their customers in markets. And that uh, drives them into cost. So for them, it's a kind of principle just carrying off Samsung. And for me, the problem is then, well, how are you going to do that in your patent system? But ask the experts because they, they are patent lawyers, I'm not. OK, well, Aaron Wood, you are a lawyer who specialises in trademarks and brand protection. What do you think about the patent laws in the US in this case? Well, the US patent laws have come under some criticism in this. The main juror actually came out afterwards and spoke to the press and said we had to judge it based upon the laws as they are, even though we didn't want to necessarily come to that outcome. 
the the laws across the world on patents do differ. The US is one of the few countries that allows you to have what's called software patents, and that's one of the points that um, led to Apple winning in this one. Other parts of the world say you can't have patents just over software. And some of those designs that the US, they were design patents again. So, again, some of those wouldn't have been available in other countries. The US law on patents is uh, too broad. It does allow things which I would agree uh, hinder innovation in a market which is moving very quickly. This isn't a new problem. Uh, Software developers have been saying this is a problem since the 80s. So the fact that it's still going on does smack of protectionism for Silicon Valley a little bit. Dr. Demisha, you're a lecturer in intellectual property. What do you think? Do you think the US patent laws are too broad? I wouldn't say that. One thing I would add about the, the case in the US is it's interesting that there's actually a jury verdict. And uh, every time I hear such a complex patent case decided by a jury, I start questioning whether they had the expertise to actually make a decision of this sort. Apparently, I was reading they reached the decision just in a couple of days, and, uh, and uh, this matter was of such a complexity that sometimes I'm, I'm wonder about the system, per se, and how can actually they analyze this kind of really complex patent cases and plus award damages of this sort. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. Today, we're discussing the courtroom clash between technology giants Apple and Samsung. Here in the London studio, I'm joined by the designer, Kevin Palmer, the intellectual property lawyer, Aaron Wood, and the professor of entrepreneurship, Bart Clarissa. Joining the discussion over the phone is the innovation lecturer, Dr. Gaetano Demeter. Samsung did say that um, in its statement after the court's decision that it seems like patent law can be manipulated to give one company a monopoly over rectangles with rounded corners. As a designer, Kevin Palmer, would you be scared to launch a product that was a rectangle with some rounded corners and a glass screen? I am now, certainly. Um, But I agree with the points made earlier. I think the whole area is a a very grey area, and from what I understand, um, going a, a case like this, going to a jury, is 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 quite rare. Um, I understand that the the, uh, the jurors had to go through about 700 different questions and came to a conclusion within three days. Which for a lot of people, they said that uh, actually the jurors were probably just getting uh, bored and wanted to go home. And did they actually make the right decision? Um, but I think uh, the point that was made earlier about innovation is a, is a really good one. I think it does stifle innovation. I think every good government in Parliament has to have a good opposition. Um, I I think it's right that Samson are there uh, as a, um, an opposition to the behemoth that Apple is becoming. And much as I love the brand, they, they have to be careful. They're becoming the new Microsoft, and um, there's not a lot of love for Microsoft, and there's a hell of a lot of love for Apple. And I think from a consumer's point of view, that, that can easily start to change. I mean, they're definitely the, the biggest company in the world right now, and uh, they're still producing fantastic products. And you can't deny that when you look at the iPhone and you look at the phones that came before that, the iPhone absolutely changed the uh, the landscape of, of uh, and the whole meaning of what a phone meant. It's now a it's now a computer in your hand, not not necessarily a phone. And I think anybody in Nokia would agree that they're actually not particularly good phones. Um, but the fact that they're such great innovators um, uh, d- d- doesn't mean that anybody else can't innovate or they should restrict or confine other people to to push what they think is the, the best phone and try and create something else. Um, I think Apple, from a product design p- point of view, have a lot to, to recognize in people like Dieter Rams, who worked for Braun and was a designer from Braun, and they've obviously taken design cues and design hints from his stylings. You know, that, that's how us des- as designers work. We, we uh, you know, we we take inspiration from lots of different spaces, from lots of different media, um, and it's hard to sort of pinpoint exactly where ideas come from and, and, and who's responsible and who actually owns that as an idea. And I think absolutely the point that was made earlier that how can you own a touchscreen? It's just ridiculous. Professor Chris, I'll go back to you then. I mean, Samsung have said here that the jury's decision is a loss for the American consumer because it will lead to fewer choices, less innovation and potentially higher prices. Do you agree with them? Well, I don't know in this particular case because Samsung will fight back and there will be other trials. I don't think that the consequences will be very uh, big for this particular case. I'm much more worried about all the entrepreneurs that want to do something in that space because the platform of the iPhone and the Android, they rely on applications that are built by entrepreneurs. 
And that's the big thing. Uh, who's going to want to design something if you know that you're going to end up in a patent battle? You can never win. Uh, so the real case here is about if we want to have platform innovation, in this case, going forward, having people developing applications, and even in a business-to-business -business world, like mobile health, if we want to go in that space using these devices, who's going to take a move if you want to end up with one in a patent battle with one of the biggest cash flow companies in the world? So you enter into a very, very strange area and the consequences are not so big for us as consumers for particular mobile phones. The consequences are much bigger for emerging industries that are based on these devices. Uh, and I think about mobile health in the first place because that's one of the biggest areas where these devices will have an application outside the fun games and outside the fun sphere. And I wouldn't like to be a company that is today starting, let's say, with... Uh, patient registers or diagnostics or uh, um, dermatology diagnostics now knowing that you might infringe some patents by, uh, by Apple because you will have to consider that in your whole business case. And that's a liability no venture capitalist will want to take uh, and no other corporate investor will want to take neither. And I think that's the big problem of this patent legislation battle. I hope it's just a fan that will <laughs> faint away and people will forget uh, if not, uh, and if it uh, continues, I think it might turn back in the brand of Apple. And I agree with you. I don't buy Apple because of its brands. I don't even care that uh, that uh, uh, Samsung has a similar phone. I wouldn't even buy a Samsung because it's similar. I just stick to the Apple brand. So I think the thing they do is uh, has bad consequences outside the industry they didn't imagine and has no consequences, no positive ones for the Apple fans today. What about you, Aaron Wood? You're a lawyer who specialises in trademarks and brand protection. Do you think the current intellectual property and patent laws do stifle innovation? I have found that to be the case. We, we see lots of smaller clients as well who are looking at uh, new applications, new, uh, new technologies. And, of course, one of the first things that we need often they need to do is to go off and do quite expensive patent searches. And that itself is a cost. And then you come back and say, well, here are a raft of patents they may or may not be valid. Here, there is a cost to checking whether they're valid or not, and then the cost of potentially challenging them. It is a, it's certainly a, a roadblock for many businesses. Um, I, I, I would say that if, if it's a business that's looking at the US, it's a particular problem. Um, obviously, the, as we said, already the US position being that they're having these broader patents, that the, uh, the, the risk is, is even greater. And of course, the the, the problem in the US as well is that there, there's a problem around damages, that you get greater damages for, for willful infringement. So if you knew that that patent was there, uh, or you should have known it was there, and you still infringed it, that then it's an even bigger reward. So, so it's a, definitely a, a stifle to, to, to innovation. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think I have to say that it's, it's really bad for, for entrepreneurs. It's really bad for innovators. I think more than that, though, it's really bad for consumers. Um, and the only people who are winning out of this situation are the lawyers. Um, they're rubbing their hands, no doubt. And um, from what I understand, charging $581 an hour. I wish I could charge that as a designer, but uh, there we go. I guess the, the only um, other... Uh, innovation in the patent procedure is that in the US they brought in uh, the, the ability to sort of crowdsource review because whenever you patent uh, you apply to patent something it gets examined by somebody who may or may not know the industry that well and they go and they do these searches as well as they can to see whether it will be a valid patent they've now brought in a, a new system where the crowd can look and they can make comments to the examiner as well and so from the point of view of watching if there was Again, it comes back to uh, to other, the other speaker's comments that it, it really only works for the bigger patent, uh, the, the bigger companies. But if somebody is interested in that area, then it's always worth watching what companies are doing and commenting mm. before they get registered as patents. But, yeah, it's still not the best. <laughs> Dr. Demeter on the phone, what do you think? I mean, this is an ongoing argument, and, and depending on, on, on the market, specifically on this market, I could generally tend to agree, but we don't have to forget that uh, patent is uh, the main form of incentive for new invention in order to guarantee some sort of timely monopoly on some sort of technology. Then the problem with their connection with innovation derives from the fact how detailed that patent is and how 
this pattern could actually be used uh, in other form in different ways by other company. In a fast-growing environment such as mobile phone, I tend to agree on the fact that uh, guarantee of broad patent could actually block the market for any other for the entrance of any other competitors, and that would of course simply innovation. You're listening to the Voice of Russia in London. I'm Vivian Nunes, and today we're discussing the battle of the smartphone playing out between Apple and Samsung. I'm joined by intellectual property lawyer Aaron Wood, designer Kevin Palmer, professor of entrepreneurship Bart Clarissa, and on the phone we have the innovation lecturer Dr. Gaetano Demita. Okay, what do we think then? This is something you touched on before, Kevin Palmer. What do we think this court case has done for Apple's image? Are Apple now seen as greedy and litigious like they were in the 80s? Or is Samsung seen as a copycat by anyone other than Apple disciples? Kevin Palmer. Yeah, I think this is a this is a tricky one for Apple and one they need to, to, to play very carefully. As I said before, they're very much in danger of becoming the... Uh, uh, a big behemoth in the same way that Microsoft was uh, was was not a love brand at all. Um, but there is a hell of a lot of love for Apple and uh, a lot of Apple disciples out there, and I consider myself one of them. Um, they are true innovators. They have created a fantastic product. There's no doubt about it, and they will go on and do so for in other areas of electronics like the Apple TV, which is coming soon, and, and, and I'm sure they'll make their way into other areas as well. Um, but um, I think they do have to be very careful, especially if the decision goes um goes to um, Sam, the decision goes Apple's way in terms of Samsung products being taken off the shelf and uh, and removed. I think that's particularly bad, and um, uh, and as said before, sort of particularly bad for innovators as well and small businesses wanting to move into the electronics market and not necessarily the phone market, but uh, as was mentioned before, in other industries as well, uh, have to be careful of creating those rectangular shaped objects with curved corners. So even if it's a win in the courtroom, you think in the eyes of consumers it might be a loss for Apple. It could be a big turning point. Point, an absolutely big turning point, especially with um, Steve Jobs not being at the helm anymore. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it could be a big turning point for the company. Professor Clarissa, what do you think? I agree. I think this will be, uh, in the end, a problem for Apple's brand image. Uh, of course, they design nice products, but Apple TV is something completely different. It's a Me Too design. It's not a breaking new, it's not creating a new market. Um, I've been an Apple fan for many years, and then I turned into the IBM computers, and then I came back for an Apple fan. I think um, at this moment it doesn't hurt yet, uh, but they will seriously have to reconsider their strategy. They always have been a fan company driving on communities, um, and these communities have been voluntary communities. The success of Apple, uh, or the smartphone, is the Apple Store, the iPhone Store, and the App Store, which is basically nobody earns money except Apple on the App Store. Uh, so it's a fun community game. Uh, no, they uh, are beating a competitor almost into illegality, which makes that from a boring company also a fun community company in a way. And that creates a totally different image. Um, I can't say that in five years' time we will talk about Apple in this way. I'm, I'm more skeptical about that than three years ago when I thought they would move into the iPad and, and rather even, even abandon the iPhone market because it is go getting into consolidation anyhow. I thought that m might have been a better strategy than trying to uh, lengthen the product life cycle of the uh, iPhone with patent battles. At this moment, I think it's a bit, uh, they're a bit lost in creativity maybe. They don't have Steve Jobs anymore and we cannot underestimate the importance of a very powerful guy uh, who can manage the board. No, they are managed by the board. They don't manage the board anymore and I think that's a turning point. I think also they have to work Bear in mind, and I'm sure they are, but it's a it's a it's a big point that Samsung make uh, a lot of the chips for the iPhone and the other Apple products. And you have to be careful; you can't sort of step over your distributors and your suppliers, and likewise vice versa. And it's uh, it's it's going to be a tricky one for them. Well, they already had to take out the push function in uh, in mail and all this. Huh? So it's mm. uh, it's already it's small minor details mm. already getting difficult, mm. and I think it distracts the attention from the real thing. How, do, how are they going to come and create the next product that changes 
the market rather mm. than fighting on customer segments. I think that's really important. I think it'd be really good for Apple to turn their attentions away from a very expensive, what is a very expensive luxury market. It's a, it's a lot of money, an iPhone to most people, £500, and it's uh, plus. And I think it'd be interesting to see Apple turn their attentions to uh, a, low, a low cost phone to, to something that could be actually for a phone for the people, for, for everyone, and, and to see what happens there. Aaron Wood, you're a lawyer but an Apple consumer. What do you think this has done for Apple's image? Well, I, I agree that the, the big issue is, is around the developer community and, and the effect that that'll have, that Apple relies so heavily on the apps and all of the content that if you start, uh, that, you know, if there is an effect on that, uh, on that community that obviously they'll move potentially onto, onto the other, onto the Android or onto open source it, a bit more. And of course, it only takes a few very, very good applications, a few very, very good games to, to start swinging things. I, I don't think it's going to have uh, a massive effect at the moment, simply because I think a lot of uh, consumers, the, most of the, the Apple consumers, re it w won't necessarily have picked up so much. But I think that when it comes uh, further down, the, tr down the, the pipeline as to the way in which those developers um, move on to other platforms, that, that will be where the effect we had. So I don't think immediately, but potentially down the, down the track. Dr. Demeter, you, one of the things you lecture in is strategy. Was it a good strategy for Apple to take this battle into the courtrooms around the world, or was it a bad one? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I have to admit that, uh, I mean, the image that Apple was giving on itself in the past was about sort of religion. So they were at the top of the market because their products were better, cooler, and uh, that's why consumer went for Apple. I'm not sure if this, uh, this actually could turn out in the future with a lot of consumers turning their sympathy towards Samsung. I did ask a colleague in the newsroom this morning, if, or all of my colleagues, if they used Apple or Samsung, and one of my friends did have a Samsung phone, and she said it's very much like the iPhone, but half the price. So maybe yeah, it was... Not only half the price, it's open source. You can download a lot of applications, you can access a lot of websites, and... Uh, a streaming video that you wouldn't be it wouldn't be possible to access from iPhone. So they, they are start getting something more than a uh, common iPhone. And if uh, Apple lose uh, its position, then uh, a lot more consumer are going to move into Samsung. I, I already noticed between friends a lot of sympathy is growing because of this case itself. So, saying, okay, I, I don't want to stick with Apple. I'm going to move to Samsung just because of the case. That's all we have time for today, I'm afraid. We'll be watching the court battles play out with interest, I'm sure, and whether we all become Samsung disciples in the future. For now, I'd like to thank each of my guests who joined me in today's discussion. We were joined in the studio by Professor Bart Clarissa from the Imperial College London's Business School, Aaron Wood, the Head of Trademarks and Brand Protection at the law firm Briffa, and Kevin Palmer, the Director and Co-Founder of the Interaction Design Studio Kin. On the phone, we were joined by Dr Gaetano Demeter, a lecturer in Intellectual Property, Innovation and Strategy at Queen Mary's University. Thanks to each of you for your time. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. Stay tuned for the news. Thank you.